I wanted to just go ahead and, and welcome everyone who's joined us so far. I'm sure a few more folks will trickle in to our um, eighth edition of our homesteading series. So we've been doing this now for a couple of months at the Department of Agriculture. Um, we've gotten a lot of really great feedback. Um, you guys have encouraged us to um, bring on new and interesting topics that um, you guys have interest in. So I think this was one. We started out with with like four Unknown or five participant topics. is now joining. And, um, and forest farming quickly emerged as something that you guys wanted to, to hear more about. So we've got some awesome presenters tonight that um, we'll jump right into it here quickly and, and hear from to give you a quick overview, we're going to first hear from Ed, Dan Ed Daniels. He's with Shady Grove Farm. Uh, he's going to talk all about ginseng, and this guy knows his stuff. I've had the pleasure of spending some time with Ed um, firsthand, and um, boy, did I learn a lot, and do I have a lot to learn. Um, we'll also hear about forest farming mushrooms, shiitake mushrooms specifically from Elmcrest Farms Park Ferguson. So we'll also have a video from him and, and do a quick uh, Q&A. And then also uh, nettles. We're going to hear from Russ Dean about how to uh, wild forage some stinging nettles and how you can turn that into uh, a product, nettle tea, with his company, Sunset Tea. Um, so before we get started, just a couple of quick slides while, fo while folks are still joining us. Um, we want to tell you about, we'll first give you some contact info. Uh, we can also share that um, at the end of the, the session so you guys have time to write it down. Um, but a few of our programs here at the Department of Agriculture in our Business Development Division. Uh, first up is our West Virginia Grown Program. This is um, a branding program where folks who have uh, food and farm businesses can spread their, uh, their brand and their business far and wide. We have a printed directory that's... Um, Soon to come out, we have some really cool marketing materials that you can um, brand right onto your product print, right onto your labels, or add to in the form of stickers, T-shirts, um, on your banners for your farmers markets. Um, we have a dedicated email there, West Virginia Grown at wvda.us. It is completely free to join, um, so be sure to check that out. Also, we have our Veterans and Heroes to Agriculture. Uh, Dane Geyser is our point of contact there. Uh, recently rebranded. Recently branded, uh, rebranded to also um, bring on uh, additional folks into this program. So if you, if you have any questions, if you're a veteran um, and you're interested in agriculture, be sure to reach out to our uh, dedicated email there, vets to ag. Or Dane is probably on this call. I'm sure he'll. Um, post his contact info over in the chat box if uh, and when he jumps on. And lastly, just to tell you a little bit more about getting specific information related to agriculture in your neck of the woods, in our business development division, we have um, planning coordinators or resource coordinators. We're spread across the state. We have Casey Ganser up north, also on the call. Nathan Bergdahl, he's over in the eastern panhandle. He's here on the call. Um, Ashley Amos recently joined us. I think we probably can quit saying recently. She's been on here long enough. Um, on our team long enough that uh, she's really well um, vetted out and, and um, on our team. So she's working over in the southwestern part of this, or sorry, south southeastern part of the state. And then my name's Lacey Davidson Ferguson. Um, I'm working over here in the western part of the state. So um, feel free to reach out to us. Our contact information is there on this slide and really small letters. Um, also, you can reach out to our division directly and, and they'll um, connect you with us in uh, with regards to your respective county. Um, if you happen to be in one of the counties not listed there, uh, never fear. We tag team the regions that aren't covered and we have lots of other great uh, folks on our staff who help us field the, that area as well. All right. So without further ado, uh, we've got a lot of folks joining us. Um, Ed, I think we'll get started with your video. Is there anything you want to say, Ed, to, to kick us off before we get started? I know you've got a lot of great content in your video, but anything to tee us up? Uh, <clears throat> you know, 
the thought of ginseng season coming on is always a big excitement in our house and uh, maybe our area. Uh, coming from an area that's sort of depressed, you know, income of such from a root that they can gather doing something they enjoy in the woods is um, something that a lot of folks in our area enjoy to do and myself as well. Uh, so, yeah, we're excited about the season coming on. Starts September 1st here in West Virginia. No dig until then. <laughs> All right, Nathan, we're ready if you want to press play on Ed's video. Yeah, some of the sang here at Shady Grove on the... Uh, Ginseng side of the farm. As you can see, we've got several mature plants, and some of which have really got some large pods of berries. Those pods of berries uh, usually produce two, sometimes three actual seeds per berry. You'll see some of these berries, they'll have, uh, I've seen like 60 actual berries but only had like 96 total seed that was the most i had had i had that last year and it was off a plant very similar to this but as you can see there's uh there's a little livelihood future livelihood of shady grove the wild ginseng native appalachian ginseng tops and berries we're going to leave the roots in the ground, folks, and uh, hopefully in another few years we'll have uh, quite a crop of seeds coming off, which will generate an income for a, a decent retirement for Carol and I. Um, it may not support the whole retirement, but I think it would be a good supplement, seeing how we all need as much as we can get. It's getting costly. But as you can see here, we have several fours and threes on this farm. Again, this is what a good area with shade can produce. This is uh, roughly, oh, I'm going to say 150 yards from the area that was affected by Asplum. Um, again, it's just right down here. We're just up this little trail, just a few feet. We'll skip down here. And See if we can't get a better view for you. Um, yeah, here on the farm we've got some nice sang and um, the seeds and uh, the tops. We dry those tops and uh, my wife sells them and um, they make tea. And uh, sometimes she makes it with a mint. Sometimes she just uses the ginseng itself. But however, it's, it provides you with a little energy. Um, it's uh, very healthy. Especially with a little honey. And as you can see, we're getting closer down here to the area that is affected. And again, you can see the wide range of brightness that has taken upon my sang bed. And as I get closer, you'll see that there's a lot of light. And um, light, ginseng only requires. 20% light. It really doesn't require that. It prefers 80% shade or darkness. Um, this area that we're coming into is the area that's partially affecting. As you can see, it not only affected my beds above the road, but it's coming into my beds down below the path here or road that we're on. I prefer to call it a path. But as you see here, as you come into the area, there is ginseng. And my, it's not doing too good. It's really, really close to the ground. The ground seems awful dry. We had this area pretty well covered uh, with tops, dead and decaying tops. Uh, here's a plant that's looking like it's wilting. Uh, here's one that was affected under the log. And as you can see, these plants, I would dare say some of them are 20. 25 years old at the most uh, should be a lot bigger. You saw plants that was the same same rootstock uh, size wise, maybe a year or two younger, but uh, those earlier plants should uh, represent what this bed should be looking like. 
but as you can see they're starting to wilt a little bit they're getting sunburned as you can see the red here on the leaf that's your early precursor to sunburn this one here is next to it it's been affected um, as well uh, this one here it's starting to take on maybe a blight I'm not sure but uh, the spots there I might have to read up on that and see what's going on in this plant back here it just looks stressed you know what I mean it's the colors not right but yeah there's the sang and rose down through here as you can see here in this broad daylight now from this one here look how pale it is um, the sang's dying off Today is, uh, I believe, the ninth day of June. Uh, this thing should be much taller, much greener, but it's in direct sunlight, and uh, it's definitely taking taking its effect, wilting, killing my sang. And uh, there's some more. You know, it's, it's everywhere in here. I plant as much as my land as I can, four plants per square foot. That's been the basis of what I plan on. Okay, I've moved down to the lower uh, path or road here um, on Shady Grove Farm. I'm just trying to show how far down off the hill that light is coming. As you can see here in the foyer, we do have some sang. Um, it's back here closer to the edge. I think it's getting a canopy off of this tree above it. But however, we still have a little shade here and these plants are still doing fair to midland. Fair to midland. Pot of berries on that. Not too shabby. Not too shabby. And there's another one and another one. So, uh, but then as you get in there a little closer, you'll see that there's very few plants. A lot of them are a bit turning yellow. Um, way too early. Uh, that's the ninth day of June, 2017. The same has been in here for approximately five years. And again, uh, the patch that on the earlier video I showed of the older plants, <coughs> but healthier plants due to the shade um, we're dealing here with a lack of shade uh, nutrients are good the soil's been checked pH levels good uh, calcium levels high where it should be that provides food for the sang but um, there's something going on I believe it's the Sun pretty big hole where like I said they want to argue we'll see It's August 24th, um, got a few berry pods here that we're going to try to harvest the berries today. As you can see, I've got the nylon berry bags on them. And what we're doing is trying to keep those berries from getting lost or eaten by varmints, squirrels, moles, voles, you name it, birds. There's a lot, of, a lot of things to go after. Turkeys love them. But uh, our, our business is going to be in these seed. We need to be able to capture as well as we can. We won't always get them all, but we want a few to self-propagate. A lot of these is going to turn into $4 a piece in two years, if not more. And uh, that's how us forest farmers earn a little bit of money. Not always a sure thing, but it sure helps. Look at that. That's beautiful. That's a big four prong. What a beauty. There's something that ate the pulp off of those seed already. And found the seed laying there, so. Not sure what done that, but probably a bird of some type. This patch here has a lot of old plants in it. A lot of these plants are probably 35 years old. 
older plant, putting off a top like that and the berries, it's a lot better to leave it in the ground and harvest the berries in the top. That root will only produce more and more and more. All right. Thanks, Ed. That was incredible. Um, I'm sure people have a lot of questions. So if you do have a question for Ed, um, go ahead and, and type it there in the chat box. Um, and while we're waiting for questions to come in, Ed, I have a question for you. If you want to get started, um, you know, planning some ginseng on your property, um, how do you go about that? Is there a place where you can buy seed? Do you buy roots from, from folks or order it on a catalog? Like, how do you get started? Well, first of all, Lacey, I would highly advise anyone that's wanting to get into this uh, to contact the West Virginia Division of Forestry at 304-558-2788. Ask for Robin Black. Um, you have to have a permit to do so, and they'll come out and do a determination of the area that uh, you're wanting to plant. And all this needs to be really taken care of before you even start buying any seed or any roots, uh, just to keep things um, on the up and up. Don't want anybody to run into any problems getting permitted. Uh, basically, on the determination, they'll come out and GPS your land, and they'll look over to see also, if there's any wild medicinal ginseng growing there, uh, and if so, they will flag it, and they don't want you to plant uh, seed that's coming from, say, a farm out west or the Midwest and mixing in with wild plants. Um, and that's my understanding of why they do this determination. But, uh, yeah, there's several folks out there that you can buy roots and seeds from. And even even the, the, the rootlets uh, with a small top on it up to the age of uh, two years old, I believe, can be um, shipped without much harm. And um, there's there's folks from Maryland to Tennessee, Virginia. A lot of people's gotten into the seed trade. Uh, one of the things at uh, Shady Grove, we, we've chose to plant our seed. Uh, our roots was selected by myself from the wild and transplanted on our farm for that very purpose because the wild genetics of the seed the plant and um, we, we try to put those back out in our own little nurseries that we create and um, we'll get them up to the age of two and then we'll transplant them on out into our farm for um, a future um, area of medicinal herbs uh, mixed in with uh, cohosh golden seal nettles um, they, uh, ginseng likes to grow in around Robin the and, and, uh, so as, as you now think exiting. about getting into that, um, hobby, I would call it, of ginseng, uh, do a little research, uh, call and ask questions. I did, um, uh, Larry Harding was a great fella to help, uh, I've talked to United Plant Savers, uh, Chip there is, uh, very informative. Uh, John Stock as well. Um, those, those guys with a lot of help. Um, and, you know, not to uh, leave anybody out, anybody that I've talked to, I always ask questions about what they did. Didn't always use their, their answer, um, but, you know, research and get a, an idea of what's going to work for you. Um, the shaded areas that I was going over in the um, little video there, we had a little incident that some trees had fell in next to a power line and they had to clear them out and it opened up a, a big light area and uh, unfortunately I had a lot of plants in that area that um, we had shade before so you know things happen you know it's 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 always good to um, think about what could happen uh, deer the deer browse is unreal um, 
especially where I'm at here in Randolph County. And um, the plants will come back after they meet the age of two um, before they've, uh, or become a two prong. I shouldn't say just the age of two, but a two prong or bigger, they will come back. Uh, they're pretty vigorous if they're gnawed off or eaten by an animal. So um, I brush mine up. You know, I'll pick the limbs out from the uh, areas that we try to mow and maintain, and then I'll carry them over and sort of brush in around the uh, ginseng to create a little natural barrier so the animals are deterred from doing so. Um, doesn't always work. You know, there's always other things out there. Uh, Irish spring soap to spray on your plants with uh, cayenne pepper, uh, horse hair, a lot of different things out there. But um, think about what you're going to do because it's not as easy as it seems. Um, ginseng is a, a very strong plant and it will come back for years and years. Uh, if it's not in a real wet area. It likes damp soil, it likes shaded areas, but it doesn't want to be wet. Wet will cause it to get like a root rot and um, it, it won't take that, you know. So be very uh, smart. I, you know, when we moved to the farm that we have, uh, we had another area that we had planted on for years. And as we was harvesting from that farm, taking to the, the new farm, We'd only take a few plants at first just to see how they would adapt to the, the new ecosystems that they're being introduced to. And um, after doing that for a year or so, I felt confident to put more of our stock into this area. And uh, we have done for several years now. Um, but tilled ground, um, as you take a wild root and put in tilled ground, it's going to get much bigger. The, the root's going to grow too fast, so the characteristics of that root is not going to be the same. So your approach to planting your rootlets, if you, that's what you buy, would be important if you're thinking of trying to sell them as woods grown or wild simulated sang. Uh, we use a dipple bar. That's my approach to um, getting around that. A dipple bar or a tree spade a lot of times have been used to plant large number of Christmas trees. I've used this tool to plant large numbers of ginseng roots. It's only going to create a small little wedge into the earth's surface that you can slide a, a nice ginseng root in on a slight angle and press that dirt back tight against it. So um, all the soil around it's going to be compressed. So that, that root's going to keep its wild characteristics from that day on. And um, we feel that that's uh, very important if you're going to try to keep that wild characteristics going with the future of your sang. Uh, some folks can let it go in tilled ground. I, I know Larry and some folks do very well. But um, whenever you grow large amounts of roots real tight together, you're going to have to spray. And you get a lot of blights. And uh, we, we don't spray. Uh, we, we use natural things for spray, but we don't buy chemicals to spray with, I guess is what I'm saying. And, uh, you know, that's important because we want it to be the same plant as you would find in the wild. And as we make product from our roots, um, we choose to only use roots that may be damaged in movement or if um, we only select a few roots per year from our farm to make tinctures and such. Uh, but we use all the tops, and that's a new thing to be sustainable in the ginseng industry is using the tops. Therefore, you're leaving the root in the ground for years to come. More berries, more seed, berry juice, and the tops keep coming back. And um, they're great for teas and uh, other things. It's really coming on strong in uh, the world of uh, sustainable harvesting of ginseng. Well, Ed, thanks. You actually uh, kind of just answered another question that came in from Munsell. He says, Ed, what kind of intensity, what percentage of plants are you harvesting each year? And how do you make that determination from year to year? Do you judge by prongs um, or, or how do you go about it? And you kind of just uh, answered, but go ahead if you want to elaborate a little more. Well, um, we don't harvest a lot. Um, what we do harvest isn't really for sale. What we're doing right now is we're tincturing. Um, we, we have a customer base who follows our website and they order frequently to get our ginseng tinctures. A lot of people use it for energy and other things that little ailments they may have. But the main thing I see from it is the energy 
maybe a blood thinner uh, alertness so and a good focus so um, I use it a lot and um, so but we don't harvest a lot of roots you know and that's the great thing about a ginseng root if you make a tincture uh, it may only take a few roots instead of say pounds you know everybody when they talk ginseng they want to talk pounds I'm talking per root the value of that root one root to me is very important because many years can I collect the seed the berry juice and the tops from that root so to say one roots worth 12 bucks to me it's worth a lot more so you know we got to be more sustainable in our harvesting uh, as you're out in the wild only take a third of what you find with the mature plants don't be afraid to leave some you know that seed will create new ones so your kids and their kids and the grandkids can go back and enjoy the same hobby that you once did so let's let's think about the future and uh, let's not take it all so even on my farm we only harvest a few All right, um, and I'm not sure, Munsell, um, I may have missed something in, in um, Ed's presentation. He says, why do you need five satellites to see your forest farm? Is that something you mentioned, Ed, about satellites? Yes, yes, um, that's through the um, state forestry. The state forestry will come back and he'll have a GPS handheld unit. He'll mark the outside boundaries of your property or the area that you're trying to get the determination done on. They say that they have to have five satellites that can see that area that that ginseng is growing on. I asked him, I said, well, how many do I have? He said nine. Of course, I was on top of a mountain. And uh, so, yeah, I sort of feel like big, big brothers watching. <laughs> right, right. Well, um, and uh, kind of along that same vein, you did mention Division of Forestry earlier and, and Munsell had asked about um, harvesting and you talked about sustainable harvesting. Are there regulations about what you can harvest and when you can harvest? And if so, can you just mention those briefly for folks? Yes. Um, the ginseng season will start September 1st. Um, I do buy. I can buy ginseng at September 1st. That's green. That means freshly harvested. The dry sang doesn't come into effect until a couple weeks later. So, you know, a lot of folks try to slide out a little bit early and dig their sang. But, you know, as a buyer, we're looking for a couple things that we can determine whether it's freshly dug or if someone dug it earlier and tried to keep it in the refrigerator to make it. Um, so, you know, there's people that try to slide through and be a little bit cheesy on the law, but um, they're not getting past everybody. Awesome. Well, I am sure there are a million more questions for you. I know I could keep asking them, but um, we will stay on at the end of all of the presentations. And, and I'm sure um, Ed will make himself available by phone and email if, if folks want to contact him directly. Again, he's a wealth of, of knowledge, of you guys, as you guys have seen. Um, but we'll transition into our next topic on uh, forest farming. And I'm going to turn my video back on and turn it over here to Park. And Park, do you have any information you wanna share with folks before we get started with your video? Uh, not too much to say. Mushrooms are a, a part of what we do. You know, we're Elmcrest Farm and uh, we just focus on being a, a diversified, profitable homestead. Uh, so, you know, mushrooms and forest farming are a part of that. Uh, so hopefully this video, uh, you know, will cover everything. I'm, I could have made an hour video, so I'm sure there will be plenty of questions, and I'll be glad to field those. Great. Ashley, if you want to roll it, we're ready for the video. Good morning, y'all. This is Park with Elmcrest Farm. We have been doing uh, growing shiitake mushrooms out of oak logs for about five years. It is one of the most profitable things you can do. Uh, there is very low initial investment. Uh, most of the work is just in getting your logs started. Uh, actually, fruiting and collecting mushrooms is, is not too bad. And uh, probably my favorite thing about it is that it doesn't take up a whole lot of space, uh, especially because you can go vertically with it if, if you need to. So um, winter and spring or early spring are really the best times to uh, inoculate your logs. Uh, it's July right now, so we're just doing some as a demo to show you guys how to do it. Uh, so we've got everything set up here. 
Um, the, the first thing you really need to do is, is to get your wood. And uh, w the best for shiitake are usually white oak or uh, any other kind of oak will work too. Uh, you can also use other hardwoods, but oak is, is generally the best. Uh, so you'll want to cut a fresh, healthy uh, tree. And that just ensures that there's no other bugs or any other kind of fungi uh, already in it. Uh, you want to let it sit for about two or three weeks and just, just let the natural fungicides die in the wood and then cut your logs into uh, anywhere between three and four foot sections and uh, somewhere with like a three to eight inch um, diameter. So this one's, you know, three or four inches in diameter here. I like to cut them a little shorter, two and a half, three feet, and it's just easier to manage. Um, you know, most operations, you're going to have to pick these things up and move them from time to time. Uh, so I, I like to have them just in a little bit of a smaller size and uh, more manageable weight. So we have our log here. Um, for our drilling tool, modified angle grinder. Uh, you can get these at, you know, hardware stores, uh, you know, feed stores, places like that. Uh, it comes, you have to get a special adapter and a special bit. Um, so you can order these from, generally from the places where you get your mushroom spawn. Uh, we got, this one here comes from Field and Forest Products. Um, there's some other, you know, well-known places, uh, Mushroom Mountain. And I believe even locally in West Virginia, Hernshaw Farms is also starting to sell some spawn. So you, you may reach out to them for that. Uh, but you can you can find it online. I also prefer the sawdust spawn. So this is our spawn here. Um, you can there's some different ways you can do this. You can get little inoculated wooden plugs. I like the sawdust better. I, I think it's a little quicker one to inoculate your logs, but also quicker for the spawn to run and quicker to get you in, into production for growing your mushrooms. So the first step we're going to do is drill our holes in our log and we'll use our angle grinder for that. You want to drill about three or four inches apart and then alternate on your next row so that you can create a diamond pattern on the log. Okay, so we just drilled a couple holes uh, for you guys to see. Uh, what you would do, you would continue this pattern throughout the whole log, uh, you know, until it's completely covered with these holes. Next step, we use a thumb style inoculator. There's a lot of different tools, uh, you, you know, different ways you can do this, as I mentioned. But this is pretty simple. And, you know, just based on the amount of money we wanted to spend, um, you know, this is, a, this is a cheaper tool and a cheaper method, but it, it works just fine for us. So you jab uh, your inoculator down into the sawdust and it fills up this little chamber and you know then you're just basically going to inject this little pellet uh, into the hole that you just drilled. And what that does is it introduces the mycelium to the wood. The mycelium is going to eat its way through the wood and colonize the log. And then uh, once it's fully colonized, that's when you're going to be able to fruit mushrooms. So first we're going to inoculate here. We just jab into the sawdust, find our hole that we drilled, and punch it in. And you can drill logs uh, more heavily or maybe make your holes a little closer than what we did. Uh, you're going to use more spawn, but it'll also colonize more quickly and you'll have bigger flushes. Uh, just your log may not, may not last quite as long. So we filled these holes, and as I mentioned, you would do this you know, all over the log. The next step, what we do, we have a, just an old crock pot. We use melted uh, cheese wax or paraffin wax. You can also use soy wax, beeswax. Uh, we don't have this on, but what we would do is we would dip into the melted wax with just a you know cheap paintbrush, something like that, and then you just are going to paint over the holes, uh, the inoculation sites where you just injected 
your mycelium. Um, some people dip the ends and uh, or you know paint the ends with the wax. And the idea behind it, and you know why you're sealing this, is I, as I mentioned, you want to keep bugs and other fungi out, and you want to keep moisture in. Uh, and that is also why we don't wait too long after we cut the, the log to inoculate. It's because we want to preserve that moisture and all the sugars that are in the log because that's what the mushrooms are going to feed on and grow off of. So after inoculation, uh, you basically just have your incubation period. You want to take them to a uh, shady, wet area, uh, just you know, un under the trees or you know, if you're in a more residential area, uh, maybe just the shady side of your garage or shady side of your house, under the deck would be fine. Uh, and it takes six or eight months uh, for the logs to fully incubate and for the mycelium to fully colonize the wood. Um, you'll notice some changes uh, in the ends of the logs. They'll start to turn colors. This one's not really as pronounced. Let's check this one down here. And you'll start to see um, it'll, turn, it'll turn white with the mycelium and then eventually it'll, it'll turn black. And uh, that's your indicator uh, that they're ready to produce. You also might just see a couple random mushrooms just start, start to pop out uh, with, with the right kind of weather. Um, you can force these things to fruit and that's one of the real benefits with, with growing mushrooms is you can control the flushes. It's not like a tomato plant that it just yeah. hits and hits and hits and if you're out of town yeah. you know you're, you're out of luck. Um, these take about a week give or take a few days from the time that you uh, soak them to when they're ready to harvest. Um, as you see here. So the fruiting process, you, you will take your logs once they're fully colonized and you soak them for 12 to 24 hours in cool, ideally non-chlorinated water. You, you can use city water and uh, you know it works just fine. Um, but if you have uh, maybe like a rain barrel that you fill up or people could use a kiddie pool, if you have like a clean source of uh, you know a creek or pond that's you know clean you can you can soak them in there uh, so just 12 to 24 hours and that triggers the flush of the mushrooms uh, so once you soak them you get them out of your water and we just stand them up here on a fence uh, as I mentioned you could use your garage house barn and um, that that just kind of gets them into position so that they fruit nicely and we harvested yesterday and uh, just left this one log here so once at this point these are completely ready to harvest um, they'll, they'll start to start out in more of a concave shape and then as they mature they're gonna they're gonna open up um, so once the uh, veil is no longer attached to the stem uh, and they start to kind of to open up that's when they're ready to pick so we just come through here with a knife and we'll just cut uh, the stem off and uh, store them you know at least initially in a, in a box or in a paper bag some kind of uh, material that they can really breathe through and of course put them in the refrigerator and they'll stay good uh, for you know easily for three weeks uh, so you, you get a you get a lot of shelf life out of these things in conclusion uh, this is one of our favorite crops to grow I, I think it's one of the easiest and most profitable uh, thing products that you can produce uh, you pretty much you know just get them the labors and really getting them set up and then you just put them in the right place and more or less let nature do its thing. Um, so it's, it's one of those things that's actually, it's kind of hard to screw up. Uh, so, you know, it's great for uh, school garden projects with students, uh, perfect for a homesteader or perfect for someone who's looking to make a little extra money. Or perfect for someone who's looking to make a little extra money. All right, well, I'm going to turn the video over to Park. Um, and we already have a, a question coming in. So, Munsell asks, where do you sell, Park? And are you looking into other species or other log techniques like totems or half-buried raft beds? So, we sell uh, primarily uh, just retail dir directly to the consumer. Um, you know, we've, we've been at it for a couple of years. So, um, you know, we've, we've had a lot of success with these at farmer's markets, just selling them fresh. And, um, this, this is the only product that we've produced that we, uh, do wholesale. 
uh, or even consider it, um, you know, just because the margins are good and we were able to produce the, the kind of volume uh, that we need. So we we have sold to restaurants, um, you know, fairly consistently. Um, we had we had an Italian restaurant. We were getting uh, giving them 20 pounds a week, uh, you know, at eight dollars a pound, you know, which is which is pretty good. Just, you know, for a couple hours a week just to produce them and uh, drop them off. Um, as far as other species, we, we have, uh, experimented with lion's mane in logs and not had a whole lot of success with them. Uh, but we also grow reishi mushrooms, which are, um, uh, more of like a medicinal mushroom for, for tincturing. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't really have as many culinary uses. Um, so we, we grow them out of, uh, sugar maple. Um, so we've, we've had some success with that also. And I, I see your question here, so I'm just I'm reading off the screen. Um, the reishi we do, they're they're buried, uh, like they're like half buried raft beds. Uh, some of them we do have uh, use a post hole digger and put them in totems, uh, but the shiitake are, are kept above ground. And uh, I don't know if you all saw in the video, ours was you know kind of cutting in and out, but uh, we just stack them like log cabin style. Um, you know when they're in between fruitings. Uh, and let them just kind of charge up for for a month or two before we dunk them in water and, and force them to flush again. Yeah, and then Casey Dancer asked, what time of year is best to get started for a first-time homesteader? I um, You, you want to cut your trees in the winter or, or spring, and there's there's a couple reasons. One, the, the sugar in the logs is kind of um, not as, not as active. Uh, so it's, it's accessible, but also the bark is tighter on the trees in the winter time. And so if, if your bark is tighter, it's, it's going to preserve the logs and you're going to get a longer, uh, product, you know, life production life out of them. Um, I have always inoculated logs in the spring and, uh, this year, kind of like everything else, it was, it was kind of delayed to get our spawn. So we didn't get our spawn until maybe like, uh, late April, early May, and by then you, we were so busy with the garden and taking care of chickens and pigs and all that that I, I didn't get to finish inoculating logs. Um, so I've, I've five years later, have come to the realization that I want to inoculate in the winter. Um, so you know, my plan this year is to order early, you know, order in October, or November, and you know, make sure I have my spawn like around Christmas time and. You know, those, uh, those nights when it's dark at five o'clock and there's nothing to do, I'm, I'm going to set up in the garage or, you know, out on the porch and just, you know, inoculate 10 or 12 every night. Um, but, you know, during, during the colder months uh, is, is the best time. And another thing, I mentioned the incubation period takes six or eight months. Um, so if, if you inoculate in February, March, April, you, you could get a flush in September, October, November. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of the downfall. If you inoculate in July or August, it may be the next July or August before you get it because basically in the winter, they're, they're pretty much dormant. Um, so, you, you know, you need to think about those things as well. And then Russ says, um, do you use fresh cut logs or logs that have been cured? So you want to use fresh logs. Um, if, you know, if they're laying on the ground, uh, you know, they've fallen, in most cases, something has already killed them. There's already some fungi that has invaded. Uh, so you want to cut a fresh, healthy tree. Uh, you know, you really don't know until you get it down and uh, get a look at it, you know, how healthy it actually is. But you want to cut a fresh tree and, and just let it sit and rest uh, for two or two to four weeks. Um, and, and that'll let those natural fungicides die. But you don't want to wait too much after four you could you could really wait up to like two months and you know still do fine even even probably more than that but you know ideally perfect conditions uh, you want to inoculate within two to four weeks of cutting uh, just because there's there's more moisture and uh, more sugar in there for the mushrooms. Great. And I have one last question. So um, we ask Ed and Ed mentioned uh, the Division of Forestry is who regulates ginseng um, production, uh, harvesting, et cetera. Um, when it comes to mushrooms, Department of Agriculture does oversee sales at farmers markets. Can you speak to that for a second? Um, are there regulations around selling um, log grown mushrooms? From my experience, the um I guess growing practices are, are more so determined by the customer. 
and uh, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> I mean, my, my wife works at an apartment here, so I got to be careful. But um, there are there are types of certifications that you can get. Um, you know, GAP or mush, MGAP, Mushroom GAP is one, and that's ideal for if you're looking at wholesaling. You know, if you're trying to get a deal with Kroger, or Whole Foods, or you know, a big a big restaurant, something like that. Um, but really, what you know, what you want to do just for safe practices, just you know, for even just for personal use, is just really make sure that you have a clean water source that you're not putting them in a, the creek where your cows and pigs take a bath, or um, you know, you can't prevent deer from getting in the pond or whatever. But just you know, make sure that you're using a, a good clean water source and that you have your logs set up to to fruit in a place that there's not going to be a whole lot of critters you know coming around because. Uh, deer and squirrels will eat them sometimes and uh, if you don't harvest r- quickly enough you know when they're at their at the right time then you'll have a lot of bugs and stuff move in and that just you know once those bugs have taken a few bites and uh, you know gone to the bathroom or whatever they do they're they're more likely to get nasty quicker uh, so you, you just really want to make sure that you um, you know clean water uh, a clean place to set them up and always clean hands and a clean uh, place to store them and that that just ensures that they're the highest quality. And I guess the other point I was trying to make is um, in in West Virginia, at least, wild forage mushrooms aren't legal to sell at farmers markets yet. But you can sell uh, cultivated mushroom species like shiitake, lion's mane, reishi, et cetera. So you just have to be able to um, produce the receipt of where you purchased your spores. Um, so just kind of wanted to make that uh, distinction um, before we moved on. I do want to say one more thing. Um, you know, the, really the most efficient way to produce mushrooms is, is indoors in a climate controlled environment uh, because temperature and humidity are really the two main things that, you know, you're concerned about uh, to, to create the right environment for them to flush. Um, so, you know, you, if you're interested in outdoor, you know, just doesn't seem right for you, you, you could look at indoor um, you know, maybe growing oyster mushrooms in a in a closet in your house. Um, and there's there's a lot of different ways you can produce mushrooms besides this. Uh, we we like outdoor because we can go completely organic. Um, outdoor, you you don't have as many issues with pests. You don't have issues with competitor molds like like a trichoderma mold setting in. Um, so we we don't have to use any fungicides. We don't have to use any pesticides. And log grown mushrooms are medicinal. Um, whereas like a lot uh, of mushroom grown indoors, they, they'll have medicinal properties also, but, um, these log grown mushrooms have, uh, antiviral, anti-cancer properties. So they're, they're not just culinary. They, they are, you know, they fight disease and they prevent disease. All right. And for the sake of time, I'm going to cut park off. Uh, we see other questions coming in, so we'll make sure to, to talk about those. But we want to leave time for our last presenter. And you guys, uh, Rustine is coming up. You're going to hear from him next about his nettles that he wild harvests and turns into tea. He has been a homesteading champion. He has joined us on every single uh, series episode. I'm pretty sure he even had his videos recorded um, before we even came up with this topic. So um, we're going to switch gears for a moment and turn the uh, the stage over to Russ Dean. Uh, can you hear us, Russ? Yes, I'm still here. All right. Anything you want to say before uh, we press go on your video, Russ? Uh, no, let's just go ahead and hit go uh, and collect $200. All right, Ashley. And hello, everybody. This is Russ. I am walking out to do some cutting on some nettles and show you how it's basically done here. And I'm going to spin you around like this. If you can see this okay, this is the nettles. You've got to have some good gloves for cut, uh, cutting these nettles because like their name, they are stinging nettles. And if you don't have heavy enough gloves, they, they will go right through it. Okay, I'm going to come up here and I'm just going to come way down like that, like so. I will cut about 20 of those at least but for filming purpose 
I am just going to cut like three or four or so. And then I'm going to hang these. I'm going to take them back into the greenhouse. And on this side of me, you can see where that was the first cutting. And it is really crinkly dry. And each day... Now let me show you what... These were just done yesterday. And you can see they're all dry, mostly dried. They're still somewhat green. This little white thing hanging in here tells me what the temperature is inside. And so they we don't burn. I've got to, uh, the windows open to let all the heat and steams out. What I'm going to do is just kind of demonstrate that... I took the bag like this to be on the camera. I'm inside the greenhouse and I can feel the heat. Now I'm going to put the bag up in like this and I tore the bag at the top right here because the, the, the cord's going to come up here and I'm going to hang it up. Now up underneath I'm going to have a bucket, and when I, I'm, I got this hanging up, I'm going to take my hands like this, and just go like that, and a little bit down, and it, and all the leaves, dried leaves, all fall, up, fall down in the bucket underneath. A tea, if uh, you have a plant that you see, um, that could be turned into um, a, a tea or some other product. Uh, give it a try and uh, try it out on yourself. And uh, it, it will uh, be uh, possibly a good uh, cottage uh, type uh, industry for yourself or your, your family. And uh, then find somebody that uh, would like it also. You have a good day. Bye. Awesome. Is, is there, there any questions? I want to can you hear me. Yeah. Okay. Hey Ross. I see you the Um I'm I'm curious, are your are your plants uh, yes. all wild or are are you cultivating and growing plants also? Um, right now they're all wild. Uh, I'm experimenting with, uh, doing cuttings and seed to see how well I can do. Um, right now I have, um, about four or five cuttings here under a grow light and some of these little peat pods. Uh, and so far, uh, they've been alive in that, uh, most of them, uh, for, uh, maybe uh, uh half a month or so but uh, most of them are are wi wild uh, actually i got started in it because uh, uh most of the time i would mow those things down all oh, those awful stinging nettles and then i saw on a tv show uh y'all might remember it dr quinn medicine woman uh, they had uh, mentioned about that, uh, uh, the Jane Seymour that played the doctor, and uh, she helped cure somebody's allergy with that. Uh, but uh, it, it uh, w was r really uh, good. Uh, la last year was my first year to try it, and um, I, I, I started drinking the tea a little bit, until until I ran out because uh, some family says I need some of your tea. Then before I knew it, I was sold out and there was nothing left for me. <laughs> That's good stuff, Russ. Uh, another question came in: um, Are you sell? Where are you selling it, Russ? Are you selling it to local herbalist or um, have you found some buyers for your tea? Sounds like family members.
Uh, um, was going to be in the West Virginia State Fair at the uh, the country store, and then you seen what happened. COVID uh, jumped in and said uh, otherwise. Uh, but uh, I'm uh, looking at some uh, local shops right now, and uh, basically word of mouth, and uh, I don't know what uh, other places I'm going to be planning to do. Um, it's one of the products that I do sell here from the farm. All right. Well, that was incredible. Thanks to, to all of our speakers uh, this evening for your time and uh, your sharing your wisdom. Are there any last questions for, um, we can come back to Ed, for Park, or for Russ this evening before we wrap up? I've got one more for Russ. Okay, I've got another one for Russ. Russ. How would you describe the taste of nettle tea? It's kind of a uh, strong uh, way that I described it and a few other members of the family and some others have uh, described it. Uh, of course, it's as sweet as uh, you want to make um, if uh, anybody's interested in uh, learning more about uh, nettles uh, uh, used as a tea, you can also cook with it and things like that. Uh, check out uh, the Old Farmer's Almanac at uh, almanac.com and uh, just type in uh, stinging nettles. And there's some good articles in there about uh, the product. That's great. Um, so I think we have one more slide we will come back to. And I don't know if Ashley or Nathan, uh, I think you were jumping back and forth. I'm not sure who's going to pull the slides back up. Nathan's on it. All right. So just to uh, remind you about our next um, episode of our homesteading series, we're going to hear from Rhonda Swartwood on culinary and medicinal herbs. So that'll be next Tuesday, same time, 6 p.m., August 4th. Wow, where did July go? Um, so don't forget to tune in, save it to your calendar, um, watch for reminders on our Facebook page. You can also check back with us in the next couple of days. We'll have um, this entire recorded, edited video um, with crisp, clean video footage um, on our YouTube channel. So make sure to, to check that out as well. Um, thanks again to our speakers. Thanks uh, to all of our attendees. Um, we are right on the seven o'clock hour. So we appreciate all of your time. Uh, take care, guys. Good to see you, Ed, Carol. <laughs>